Sometimes in science it's going to be impossible for you to do a real experiment the way you want to do it. Maybe because it's illegal, maybe because it's not possible. And in cases like that, sometimes they will do what's called correlational studies, and we've talked about that. But other times, scientists will try to do what's called a model. Now a model is when you get uh, a small scale uh, example that's supposed to represent what will actually happen if you did it on a full scale. For example, since you can't really see the molecule of DNA, you can do a physical model like you see in the top left there, so you can understand the way that the DNA molecule is kind of organized. Likewise, you may not be able to do some experimentation, medical experimentation directly in humans, but you can use mice, which have similar anatomical processes, as a model for what will probably happen in humans, and usually a research will start there, poor mice. And you also have models, like for example, look here, a physical model of the sun. You also have computer models, which are computerized representations when you input variables and use the logic uh, programming of the computer to simulate what would happen based on the variables that you gave the computer, what would happen if you actually did it. And you can even use that on your own computer, your mind. And Einstein was famous for designing what we call mental experiments, where you come up with these suppositions of what would happen if this would happen. And a lot of his relativity theory was based fully on mental experiments until enough technology came through to actually do the experiments that he thought of before they were even possible. But whatever it is, theories can sometimes be based on models and experiments to which are done in models. Of course, the limitations of it is that you can't really generalize from the model to the real uh, life uh, if the model is not a proper representation of the real uh, full-scale situation. And there's always that for an inherent limitation to how much you can use. But models are absolutely very important in teaching science as well as doing science. So I have to make sure to mention a little bit about that. So it's kind of like an in-between a correlational study and an experiment. You do an experiment, but you can't really imply causation fully because you can't say for sure that you can generalize this for the real scale of what it is until you find a way of doing it on the real scale. All right? And this is very common in things like physics, biology, chemistry, because it's not all the time that you can replicate exactly what would happen in the real, uh, you can't really play with the real conditions on a full-scale experiment. Like, for example, you can't do uh, replicate things which would happen inside a sun unless you're doing it on a small scale or do it inside of a computer. Likewise, when you're doing something like nuclear physics or molecular biology, it's much easier to do it on the computer than it is to do it on for real. And finally, uh, is sometimes like physical models or, or even you know, replacement models like the mice are the only way that you can go about starting your experimental design. You, you're not allowed to start full scale. All right? And that's actually a good thing. If you even watch things like Mythbusters, they always start small scale and then they blow it up to, uh, to a bigger scale because it's easier to do a small scale to find the kinks so that when you do the big one, you, you're not going to be caught doing the mistakes which are going to be way more costly because you're doing this in full scale. All right, that's models and science. I hope you understand it and move on to the next part.